Good morning, Awaken City, and welcome to Church Online. This week, we're going to be continuing our theme of prayer and worship. Now, when I think of prayer and worship, I think of an encounter I had with God when I was a teenager, maybe about 15 or 16, where I was in worship and I literally felt like Jesus picked me up, put me on his knee and just wrapped his arms around me. And I've never forgotten that. And I just love the thought that in that moment, Jesus knew what I needed. And it was just that father's heart and that father's love. So prepare your hearts and put yourself in a position to receive and to really hear what God wants to say in and through the message from Pastor Chris that's up now. Hey, Awaken City, it is so good to join with you today as we continue our focus on being a people who take ground for prayer and worship. I believe with all my heart that the heart of God is expressed through a people who live out the realities that we can engage with the living God daily, even moment to moment, even live out of a prayer connection with the living God as we live our day-to-day lives, and that in that, as a people, we can choose to live surrendered to Him, devoted to Him, willing to allow Him to shape and mould us, to transform us from anything that would seek to conform us to the world around us through a life of worship. And so as we dig in, I wanted to submit to you a thought today out of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verse 36 to 38. It's a portion of Scripture that, I'll be honest, when I read it, it causes me to stop. It causes me to picture the scene that's played out and to picture what I would do if I was in that moment. See, I believe with all my heart that the Bible at its core is a living book. It's not simply meant to be a book that's used as a reference, although we can reference it for the blueprints for how to live a life that engages with the living God and honours Him. It's not simply to be a book filled with historical facts, although I'm amazed that the historical realities of the Scripture constantly shines out that God has been working towards saving people since the beginning. So I love the Bible because it's a living book because as we read in its pages the lives of those that lived and encountered God and for the highs and the lows and the mistakes along the way and the victories that we see a good, gracious, loving creator calling those he created to live into the life that he set for them. It says a living book because as we read these accounts, as we connect with the people caught in the pages, we get to live out today what God wants to say in to the heart of his people. And so in Luke chapter 7, this account captures a moment that starts off not abnormal to other accounts captured in scriptures where Jesus is doing part of what he does best besides healing the sick and casting out demons and teaching people about the realities of the kingdom of God and preaching to invite people into the new realities that God is calling us into, is that he's hanging out with people. He's having a meal. He's journeying at the speed of those around him that allow connection and engagement. And first, I've got to say, as a people that want to pursue prayer and worship, we actually need to be willing to do it together. I do not believe that we can be a people who take ground, who truly see differences made in our communities, in our cities, in our towns, even in the nations through us, unless we're able to learn how to do it together. We're able to learn to journey together as God calls us to be a people who take ground through prayer and worship. And in one of these situations, Jesus is having a meal He's having a meal in the home of what is described as a Pharisee. See, a a Pharisee was simply somebody who belonged to a order of that day that was designed around systems that were originally based on the Scriptures but added to by man, by man, by man, by man, by man to almost make it impossible for people to live free and whole in a relationship with God. And it's into one of these homes that Jesus is having a meal 
the home of a Pharisee, a home of somebody who is captivated and caught up in a way of life that in fact does not truly respect and represent the heart of God to people. And Jesus here is here. He hasn't retreated from this moment. It's interesting that in an invitation to come and eat with the Pharisee and obviously his family and maybe others around that Jesus would have possibly had the opportunity to politely decline, but yet the heart of God is to go into places that desperately need light, change and transformation. So here he is, Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees invited him, Jesus, to eat with him. He, Jesus, entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And a woman in the town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table of the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume and stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with perfume. I will be honest, one of the reasons why that scripture portion is so captivating to me is it's so confronting. When I'm reading through the gospel accounts, the different gospels have an account of this, where a woman walks in while Jesus is having a meal. And she's dignified, she's identified as a sinner. And I don't know about you, but in our current culture, we really don't unpack this thought of what sin really is all that often. I think deep down, especially in the life of the church, when we refer to it, I think we all know it's something bad. For most of us, we think it's when I do the wrong thing. For some, it might be reserved for things that are extremely bad, and for others, it may be reserved for things that others wouldn't consider bad. And maybe like the Pharisees sometimes, we try to define God for ourselves and we can add to or adjust to make it suit us at different points. So this woman who walks into this space as Jesus is reclining at the table, is relaxed, is enjoying the opportunity to connect and she invades his space out of her desperation. She knows she's missed the mark. See, that's literally what sin means. Sin means to live our life missing the mark. And it's usually expressed through our lifestyle, through our choices, through the decisions that we make and the actions that follow on from that. See, it's as if God has set up for us a way of life, a way to walk that is most fruitful, most vibrant, most healthy, most life-giving. And I don't know about you, often I can see that path set before me, but sometimes because of my disappointments or my distractions or my disillusionment, I lose sight of the path before me and I begin to see things off the path and would imagine that that thing, that thing there is the thing that I need to live whole and free and fulfilled. And what happens is that if my life had a targeting system that is directing me on the way to go, I begin to get captivated and caught up by this thing or this way or this response that sometimes is coming because I deeply want something or sometimes even coming deeply because I'm broken. And I lose track of the direction that God would lead me on and I miss the mark. It's as if I've got a bow and arrow in hand and instead of lining up and hitting the target that God is leading me to hit with the way that I live my life, I lose sight of the target and I miss the mark. Not even hitting the board but shooting off in the opposite direction. So that's literally what sin is. Sin is a choice and a response out of that choice that has led me to miss the mark of who I really am and who I'm really called to be. See, if nothing else, sin is more like a sickness. 
It's something that's causing us if we engage with it and live it and even intentionally pursue it to live a life so much less than what is really honestly available in the heart of God. So into this scene, Jesus reclining, obviously, hopefully having eaten a fantastic meal, has a woman who is identified as a sinner walk in. And she walks in not to be condemned, not to be destroyed, not to be brought down, not to be punished. She comes in to worship. She comes in, as it says, to give a gift. She brought an alabaster jar, a stone jar filled with perfume. This jar would have represented great worth, would have represented great wealth to her. And she comes in for the express purpose of taking from what she has and pouring it out at the feet of Jesus because she actually understood who Jesus really is. Jesus is the only one worth worshipping in all of life. He's the only one worth pursuing to the point that she's willing to go into a stranger's home for the express purpose to have an opportunity to pour out what she has so that she can give it to him. See, in this portion of scripture, I think it unpacks some principles for how we can live a life of prayer and worship, how we as a people can live a life where we do not allow ourselves to be captivated and caught up with the things that would cause us to miss the mark and be taken off and distracted off from who we're really called to be. So it all begins that we're willing to pursue Jesus. It's interesting that she wasn't waiting for Jesus to come and find her. She knew where Jesus was and she went to him. Now, I'm not saying that God will not find us where we're at and will not call us out, but there's something about worship that means that we choose as a people to come to God. So when we come together on a Sunday, we've made a choice to get up at a certain time, brush our teeth, eat breakfast, get the kids ready, get dressed, get in the car, drive in, all so that we can meet together as a people so we can worship God. It takes a choice and an intention. And it takes a choice and an intention to choose to live a life that honours God in our day to day. And to do that, we have to pursue Jesus in the midst of everything that we're in. And so the woman identified as a sinner, she'd missed the mark, identifies that the way to hit the mark is simply to pursue Jesus. Here's how to live life free from sin. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God in heaven. We get to fix our focus. She walks into the room, bang, sees Jesus. She kneels down. She begins to cry. You know, the crying to me speaks of the fact that in worship, We often need to confront our reality. For worship to be real, we have to confront our reality. See, worship is not about putting on a show for God. Worship is not about trying to appear as something we're not. Real worship is about coming to God as we are, pursuing Jesus as we are, but falling before him and confronting the reality of who we are and our desperate need for him. See, It's okay to come to grips that we desperately need the love of God in our lives. It's okay to be broken before him because if we're not broken before him, we'll live broken by the world around us. Because as we come to him in our brokenness and our despair, what he does is he wipes away every tear and he puts us back together. The woman designated as a sinner fixates on Jesus, enters into that room and confronted with her reality, brings it to him. And in that, it says that in 
In verse 38, standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wash his feet with her tears. She was bringing everything to him in the hope that as she brought it to him, he would bring restoration to her. See, a life of true worship is a life poured out. It's not a life of hiddenness. It's not a life of holding back. It's not a life of trying to be to God something we're not. It's a life that is willing to come to him in the midst of all the mess. Say, Jesus, here I am. Help. 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 I cannot find my way without you. She anoints his feet with her tears. It says she wipes his feet with her hair. She wipes her tears away with her hair. Here's the other thought about true worship. We have to be willing to exchange our glory for his glory. We have to be willing to lay down everything that we would put our identity in, our pride in, our understanding in and give that to him. Because as we exchange what is our glory for his glory in true worship, we're put back together again. Because everything that we glory in ourselves, everything that we would build our lives on apart from him cannot stand before him. But as we come to him first, he redeems everything that we are and everything that we have. She wipes his feet with her hair. She kisses them. I've got to admit, that's a challenging thought. She's knelt down. She's causing a scene. She's kissing his feet. You know, in this situation, she understood who Jesus really was, the only one who could save her. And while I'm not proposing that any of us go into any random person's home, kneel down, wipe their feet with our hair and kiss their feet, the truth is she understood who Jesus was and that in that kissing what she was showing was genuine devotion and love to him. That everywhere else that she divined, defined herself by devotion and love, she was actually coming to Jesus to be the brand new definition of what love really is. Out of that worship is lived. And it goes on. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with perfume. Worship costs. She poured out what she had. See, it was meant for her. The perfume was meant for her. Alabaster, stone jar had been set aside. It was valuable, so, so valuable, and yet she was willing to pour it out. Here's the key, church, as we move forward into the season that God is calling us into, to live out true worship, we have to be willing to lay ourselves down, to sacrifice from ourselves, to give, not to make God happy with us because he's already happy with you, not to try earn something from God because there's nothing we could do. He's freely given us everything. No, it's to change us. It's to change us from living a life where while we might have the alabaster jar and perfume on the shelf and find great value in the fact that we have it and it belongs to us, now we're willing to take what belongs to us and pour it out to him because we understand that a true life is honestly built on understanding that we need to live a life of worship and we live a life of worship not simply by raised hands while we're singing songs on a Sunday, although that is valuable to do alongside one another, worship is lived out in the way we choose to live our life and it's lived out by those that are willing to pour themselves out to Jesus, for Jesus, so that he can change and transform us. In our Awaken City, I want to encourage us as a people, let's be a people who take ground for prayer and worship. It's so a final thought. At whatever point you're engaging with this message, if this finds you and you recognise in this thought, man, I need to get my life in order. I've been captivated by things that have taken me off track. I need to come into alignment with the heart of God. It's very simple. Scripture says that we are saved if we confess Jesus with our mouth and believe in our heart. And if I could just invite you right now where you are, 
To pray a simple prayer, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, help. Jesus, I give you my life. And if you're willing to begin with a prayer like that and then follow through with some response and some actions to put yourself in a position to grow in your faith, God will meet you where you're at. You can email us at hello at awakencity.com.au and allow us the privilege and the honour to help you in your journey. For those of us who are members of Awaken City, both in person and online, could I encourage you this year to make a concerted effort to marry your faith and your finances together? One of the great honours I have in serving the local church is not just in physically serving through gifts and graces, it's actually in coming and submitting to God out of the resources I have in generosity to sow into the house of God. And so I'd encourage you to make a choice. Follow through on the giving options on the screen. Make a choice this year to be a person that leads with generosity into the house of God as a priority above anything else. Because as we live out a lifestyle of worship, we're bringing into an alignment the way we live with the heart of God. Such an honour to be a people that choose to take ground through prayer and worship together. God bless you. Have an amazing week ahead.